This podcast is an invitation to feel and experience the souls of famous old Hollywood homes and to have an in-depth journey to the areas where they're located through interviews with longtime residents. Either you're a fan of old Hollywood in Los Angeles planning to have a vacation or an even bigger step, considering a certain area for your future home. This is your opportunity to receive valuable information and insightful advice you won't find anywhere else. Hello, hello, and welcome to my podcast. Are you in the mood for California? Today, we'll explore Beverly Hills, featuring an interview with incredible Alex Rotaro. And this apartment that I'm in is the second place that I live that is connected deeply with Hollywood history. And yes, from my patio, I I can see, on one hand, I can see uh, all the big uh, agencies, CAA and um, uh, WME that, uh, that moved to Century City and the Century City skyline. And then right in front of me is the Peninsula Hotel. There's one building between us. And then to one side is the Waldorf Astoria. Mm-hmm. It is a bit interesting. I, I must confess that on, on some days when I feel quite rebellious, I go sunbathing and <laughs> uh, and show, uh, well, let's not. I, I do a little bit of a brave heart to CAA on some days. Let's just say that. Masha Korpacheva is a California-based realtor and a member of the National Association of Realtors in Los Angeles. She's an advocate for selling and buying homes with soul and practicing mindfulness in real estate. With master's degrees in spiritual psychology and linguistics, Masha brings all of her skills to work with her clients. An intuit and empath, she has touched many lives with her outstanding ability to see beyond the visible and helping to come to better understanding of issues and their resolutions. An adventurous world traveler, from climbing Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania to exploring the Galapagos Islands, Masha has a particular passion for the City of Angels. Having landed in this paradise and adopted it as her home, she's been sharing old Hollywood stories since 2007. In the mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood. And now, are you ready to experience Beverly Hills? Once upon a time, in the sun-kissed land of Beverly Hills, the story begins with whispers of water echoing through the ages from the Tongva tribe. They called it El Rodeo de las Aguas, a poetic homage, meaning the gathering of the waters. As the time danced by, this idyllic spot evolved from ranches to fields of lima beans, quietly awaiting its destiny. Then, like a scene from a Hollywood script, enter Burton E. Green and his band of oil investors dreaming of black gold beneath the soil. Though oil remained elusive, water bubbled forth abundantly, birthing a town where none had stood before. Inspired by the elegance of Beverly Farms, Massachusetts, Green and his wife cast a spell of transformation, renaming the humble bean fields as Beverly Hills, a moniker befitting its newfound allure. With a stroke of visionary brilliance, landscape architect Wilbur D. Cook sculpted the streets, weaving a tapestry of curves and commercial districts, setting the stage for a grand debut. But no grand debut is complete without a star-studded premiere. And in 1912, the Beverly Hills Hotel took center stage. More than just a hotel, it became the heart of the community where travelers rubbed elbows with locals and dreams shimmered in the California sun. Meanwhile, Hollywood royalty Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks added their sparkle, planting roots in the fertile soil of Pickfair in 1919, beckoning others to follow in their glamorous footsteps. The same year, 
the Los Angeles Speedway roared onto the scene, hosting auto races. Spanning the southwest quadrant of the city, this track became a symbol of speed and excitement. Amidst the adrenaline-fueled races, in 1923, Beverly Hills faced a water shortage dilemma, prompting a proposal for annexation by Los Angeles. Led by Mary Pickford, voters rejected the plan, safeguarding their local identity. Even after his passing, celebrities like Will Rogers continued to play a vital role in civic life, honored by renaming a park across from the Beverly Hills Hotel in his memory. In the late 1920s, Beverly Hills started to undergo a transformation marked by architectural splendor and civic expansion. The prestigious Beverly Wilshire Hotel emerged in 1928. That same year, Edward Doheny bestowed Greystone upon his son a lavish 55-room mansion and estate that now serves as a park, film shooting location, and event venue. Architect William Gage's Spanish Renaissance masterpiece, the Beverly Hills City Hall, rose majestically in 1932, embodying the city's commitment to timeless elegance. Alongside, the quaint Santa Monica Park blossomed into the expansive Beverly Gardens Park, stretching gracefully from Wilshire Boulevard to North Doheny Drive. At its heart, the electric fountain cast its enchanting glow, featuring a central pillar adorned with a kneeling Tongva native, a tribute to the land's rich heritage. Water supply concerns in the 1930s reignited talk of annexation, but Mary Pickford and Hollywood luminaries rallied residents against it, preserving Beverly Hills' independence. The iconic Beverly Hills shield, designed in the same era by Warner Brothers, still marks the city's boundaries today. As the decades unfolded, Beverly Hills continued to sparkle and shine, evolving into a beacon of sophistication and style. To maintain its status as the region's top shopping destination amidst rising competition from neighboring malls, Beverly Hills took action. In 1989, Tu Rodeo and its pedestrian path, Via Rodeo, emerged as a bustling hub drawing both shoppers and tourists and serving as a popular setting for photography and filming. And so, as the curtain rises on the 21st century, Beverly Hills stands tall, a shimmering jewel in the crown of California. With each passing year, it honors its past while embracing the future, a testament to the resilience and spirit of those who dared to dream amidst the palm-lined streets of Beverly Hills. And here we are. Welcome to Beverly Hills. I'm so delighted to have Alex Rotaro here with me. Alex Rotaro is an internationally known multi-award winning filmmaker. A polymath born in Romania, he moved to the U.S. after a successful career in film acting, which led to the highest distinction available to Romanian young actors to pursue a degree in physics from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he graduated at the top of his class with a 5.0 GPA and a degree in theoretical physics. Inspired by studying cinema at the Sorbonne in Paris, Alex switched gears and earned a film production MFA from University of Southern California's School of Cinematic Arts. Rotaru's directorial prowess shines in acclaimed documentaries like They Came to Play and Shakespeare High. As a cultural ambassador, 
he traverses the globe, sharing his expertise and fostering international exchange. Known for eliciting profound emotions from subjects, his work includes collaborations with luminaries like Mona Golabek and Carol Connors. Recipient of the Christopher Award, Rataru is celebrated for his ability to unearth compelling narratives as evidenced by his insightful interviews with literary figures like Louis Gluck and John Ashbery. Alongside his filmmaking, he remains active in theater and resides in Beverly Hills with his son, Max. Alex will share with us what it feels like to live in a lovely neighborhood of Beverly Hills called Roxbury Park. Hello, Alex. Hello, Masha. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? I'm excellent. Uh, not to quote Hamlet, indifferent well, because that would be a little wrong, but uh, <laughs> I like that saying, indifferent well. Could be better, could be worse. Okay, okay. We'll very... call it wonderful. <laughs> I was so looking forward to our conversation, and I had a very deep feeling that it will be absolutely wonderful. And uh, yes, so here we are to talk about your life and the place where you live, and can we please start uh, with maybe your personal description of what it feels like to live in the Roxbury Park neighborhood in Beverly Hills? And you're just within very short walking distance uh, to prestigious landmarks like the Waldorf Astoria and Beverly Wilshire Hotel and famed Rodeo Drive. What is it like to live there? It's quite extraordinary. I grew up in communist Romania and I was a little kid when I first became aware become uh, I became aware of uh, of uh, Beverly Hills I became aware of the film industry my parents were both in the film industry and I grew up in the film industry in Romania it's uh, it's been a dream of mine to even visit let alone live here and now mm -hmm. I've lived here for for a number of years and I'm a huge fan I even graduated from this program that the city hall offers called team Beverly Hills that takes you on all these historical tours and I am a big fan of history not just entertainment industry history but history in general mm -hmm. and I've always liked I believe objects and places carry an energetic imprint of everything that happened there. Even if you don't want to go spiritual about it, yes. think of it from a quantum mechanical point of view. Totally. And there is an imprint. Uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner, the anthroposophist, talks about the Akashic records, the ability to extract that information. I don't know how to do that, but I think that the human body is an apparatus that is able to decode. You know, when you walk into a place and it feels haunted or you get a feeling or you get a smell like uh, Marcel Proust, the smell of the pastry that brings back the entire association of an entire seven tome novel, uh, which is why I like Madeleine's. But um, for me, the places have had to come with this type of charm. And, you know, I mean charm in both the term of uh, in both senses of the term as uh, appeal and mm -hmm. also as a bit of magic, a bit of this quantum mechanical residue of past inhabitants, of past occupants, of the energy of things that took place here and and people who breathe here. And this apartment that I'm in is the second place that I live that is connected deeply with Hollywood history. And yes, from my patio, I I can see, on one hand, I can see uh, all the big uh, agencies, CAA and um, uh, WME that, uh, that moved to Century City and the Century City skyline. And then right in front of me is the Peninsula Hotel. There's one building between us. And then to one side is the Waldorf Astoria. Mm -hmm. It is a bit interesting. I, I must confess that on, on some days when I feel quite rebellious, I go sunbathing and <laughs> uh, and show, uh, well, let's not. I, I do a little bit of a brave heart to CAA on some days. Let's just say that. Uh, okay. Let the audience okay. decide what that means. And what influenced your decision to you know uh, establish your residence in this particular area. How did you end up there? I believe that the most important thing in life is dumb luck, mm -hmm. coupled with determination and a clear motivation. I started working in uh, and adjacent to Beverly Hills during my time right after film school at USC. And I have an affinity for the place because of the cinematic, cinematographic uh, and cinematic history that it has from Beverly Hills Cop to Pretty Woman to down and out in Beverly Hills. I had the feeling 
and I still do, that I had when I first went to Paris and I was 14 and I had just been reading Balzac and Dumas and Hugo. And Paris was this mythic place that existed in all these novels. And when I first went there, I was shocked to discover I could see these places. I could see these buildings. I could visit these back streets. And um, obviously, Paris is not Beverly Hills and Beverly Hills is not Paris. But Beverly Hills is sister city with Cannes. Of, mm-hmm. I don't know if your listeners know that. Uh, makes sense. And the uh, the Beverly Hills of Cannes is a neighborhood called La Californie, mm-hmm. California, French. Um, so b- being in touch, when I came to L.A., and I lived all over Los Angeles for the years I've been here, it was always a desire I had to live in Beverly Hills, not only because of the history, primarily because of the history, but also because it's a walking neighborhood. Yes. And that reminded me of Europe. Mm-hmm. Where I lived, I lived in in Boston before I lived. Um, I spent quite a bit of time in New York as well. There is a little bit of walking you can do, but you it's difficult to center an entire day with some errands, maybe a little grocery shopping, and have it all be walking. Right. As they right. say, nobody walks in L.A., right? There was a song in the 80s or 90s. Mm-hmm. I remember nobody's walking in L.A. Well, maybe not in L.A., but certainly in Beverly Hills. So those things, the green nature of, of the city, which is one of the greenest, it was designed, I learned later, uh, Beverly Hills was designed from scratch yes. by a number of uh, entrepreneurs, including uh, Doheny and Spalding, uh, the street that I live on. Mm -hmm. And uh, they first started by creating a tracing a grid of the streets and then hiring the arborist of Central Park in New York. Mm -hmm. Now, I I, sorry, I'm not prepared. It wasn't Van Cortland. I forget the name. We'll have to put it in the footnotes. It was a very famous arborist and they gave this man a rather unlimited budget. And they said, create, create perfectly symmetrical Uh, lines of trees on these streets. And many of these streets were in a grid or straight, which is why you have these perfectly symmetrical, this very unique Beverly Hills look, which has to do with the symmetry of the trees that were all planted around 1914. And there's Mm -hmm. photos of empty fields with rows of trees. These these trees were purchased as saplings. They were identical in measure. And it shows 100 plus years later, it really shows that perfect symmetry. And it's similar to what the famous architect of Paris, Osman, did when he actually destroyed historical neighborhoods because he wanted the buildings of Paris to be a certain Height. Mm-hmm. He said, I want people to come out blindfolded anywhere in Paris and know that they're in Paris. And I think just by the street. And I right. think that's something that happens in, in Beverly Hills. And of course, I also want it to be within striking distance uh, in case I have children of, uh, of the famous uh, Beverly High, uh, Beverly Hills 90210, which is, of course, a misnomer because the high school is in the residential part of Beverly Hills, which is 90212. Mm-hmm. 90210 is the golden triangle between Doheny, Wilshire and Santa Monica, where all the industry is. And there's very little residential and certainly the high school isn't there. Yes. All those things contributed to my feeling like I live in a bit of a fairy tale. And I love, for instance, now that I do have a son, we go biking in the middle of the night on Rodeo Drive. Nice. And it's just the two of us um, and uh, in the middle of the lit street. And I stop and I tell him, now this is privilege. It's not the privilege of being able to afford any of these items in these stores because they're for tourists, but it's the privilege of having this experience in this place. Yes. And I bet you feel like you have the city all to yourselves. It's just such a beautiful and uh, majestic feeling. That can happen in a walking city like Beverly Hills. Yes. Yes, yes, very true. And um, maybe you can share uh, some of your favorite places nearby, maybe some stores that you like, restaurants or coffee oh, spots. Oh, wow. Things have changed a lot. A lot of buildings are coming up. Beverly Hills is a conservative city architecturally, but lately I think there's been a lot of pressure. Let's see. I cannot forget or forsake the appeal of the Peninsula Hotel. Mm-hmm. I'm having a, a meeting there with a, a, a writer friend of mine later tonight. There are two, three spots that I enjoy at the peninsula. Uh, one of them is the lobby bar. The second one is the rooftop. And the third one is the terrace in the back. 
the open air terrace. They're all extremely charming. And um, I haven't seen this in a little while, but this is a very old school thing that I've only seen in Monaco. And that is at certain times, there are models of a certain age. Mm -hmm. They're actual genuine models, but they're in their 40s and 50s. Uh, still very model-like, and they are wearing dresses, perfume, and hats from the stores in the side wings of the hotel. Mm -hmm. And they are trained to basically walk around looking lost or acting as if they're looking for someone mm -hmm. until the wife of some industrialist sitting at a table and enjoying their cocktails says, oh my, that's a beautiful hat, at which point the model helpfully points to the store down the um, uh, gallery. I've only seen this at, I want to say, the Novotel in, uh, in Monte Carlo. Uh, I, I like that. I like that touch of uh, very, very old style. And um, what else? I love walking, like I said, and there is a place on the corner of Bedford, and uh, Little Santa Monica or South Santa Monica, which is, um, I believe it's called not Le Pain Quotidien or Quotidien mm -hmm. Bread. Mm -hmm. I like that. I like the people watching that happens there. I love the hiking in Franklin Canyon. I'm going to say no more because I don't want many people to know about it. That's right. You're suddenly in Tuscany. In the middle of LA, you're suddenly in Tuscany. And there's the very little known neighborhood of Beverly Park, which is beyond Beverly Hills and is beyond Bel Air. And if you make it to the top of the mountain on Haston Trail, you will be able to, if you have a pair of binoculars, you will see mansions with 40 bedrooms and such in different mm -hmm. styles that one doesn't even associate with Bel Air. That's not a place I like to go walking, but if you do the hikes, which are phenomenal and have saved many filmmakers' sanity, I would say, <laughs> no relation, um, you will see the this, uh, this neighborhood. I enjoy the Jewish delis. Uh, I probably prefer the matzo ball soup at the Nosh of Beverly Hills, but for the general uh, air and mystique and history, Nate and Al's is the place to go. And I've been here long enough to to go there uh, during the times when you would routinely see Larry King or Stan Lee uh, in their customary booths. Uh, there's so, so much more. But uh, those are the first things that uh, come to mind. The, the little, I, I would say that my favorite walk is down Charlieville mm -hmm. and toward the corner of Charlieville and Beverly, South Beverly Drive. That corner, those, those four corners, and they're called four corners, are, I believe, one of only three commercial corners in the United States. That's what I learned that belong to the same individual. Mm -hmm. And they belonged to a silent movie star by the name of Corinne Griffith. Now, Corinne Griffith uh, lost her stardom at the advent of sound because she had one of those voices. <laughs> that happened. To us. <laughs> that did happen to a lot. I mean, the movie The Artist uh, pretty much delves into that near the end. And she was very clever and she invested all her money in Beverly Hills. She's also one of the early heroes of Beverly Hills when in, oh, I want to say 2017, uh, no, sorry, 1917, 1918, maybe 21. Again, I'm not perfectly prepared, but there was a move for Beverly Hills to be reincorporated into Los Angeles the way it happened with Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Hollywood was an independent city, but then it got reincorporated into Los Angeles for the same reason, and that was water rights. Yes. Water rights. Now, there was a move to reincorporate Beverly Hills into Los Angeles because of water rights, and eight movie stars and directors. It was D.W. Griffith, Mary Pickford led the pack, Douglas Fairbanks, Buster Keaton, Conrad Nagel, and Corinne Griffith, and I'm sure I'm forgetting someone. It's, it's not Tom Mix. It's the other famous uh, Will Rogers. And the only person missing who helped but couldn't, two people, I believe, Charlie Chaplin and Rudolph Valentino. And, well, I think Rudolph Valentino was involved, and that's because Douglas Fairbanks was jealous. But mm -hmm. these eight megastars, founders of United Artists and all that, went and knocked door to door 
to make sure that the Beverly Hills residents do not vote to be reincorporated into Los Angeles. And they won by something like 16 votes, I think. Yes. Very, very low. And for Rin, there is a monument to all these eight individuals on the corner of Olympic and South Beverly Drive with a spiral of celluloid going into the sky in front of the pavilions. Mm -hmm. And Corinne owns those four buildings on the corner of Charlieville and South Beverly Drive. I had an office in that building for years. So that corner has a particular pull on my heartstrings. Also, my first apartment in Beverly Hills was on Reeves. There was a tiny, quaint little park right next door in which I used to go at night to relax and just think. But until I heard there was a had been a murder, that's another whole story about the famous murders of, right. of the entertainment uh, world. But those are some of my favorite things in Beverly Hills. Oh, that's so beautiful. Alex, the way you're describing everything, it's it looks like uh, every day is uh, a movie for you in Beverly Hills. And you're walking into one place and another and you're walking down the streets. And it does feel as if you are absolutely reliving in a way your fantasy and being part of this uh, magical city. And um, it feels like you're absolutely fit in. And it's um, really, really tangible to just to, you know, the way you express it. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. Every day is not a movie. Every moment is a movie. I think yes. reality is is a perception, right? Yes. So much, not not all of it. I mean, if you perceive the street as being empty, but there's a car coming and you step in on onto the street, you may find that reality and your perception are not the same. But the way you perceive things, for the most part, will dictate how you what's the next step you take. Yes, a hundred percent. If you if if you have something that inspires fear you might hold back. If you if you experience something that inspires a feeling of nostalgia or, or love or excitement, you might step forward in, in, in a variety of ways. I have two favorite French writers. I mentioned several, actually. I mentioned Proust, but there's also Patrick Modiano that, who won the Nobel Prize a few years ago for literature and probably my recent favorite uh, for the last 10, 20 years, I would say, uh, Michel Houellebecq. Mm -hmm. And they both, regardless of what you like or don't like about either of them, they speak about the relationship between memory and location, yes, memory and place. And this is extremely important. My, my first hint when I moved to LA and I was living all over, I lived from Silver Lake to Marina del Rey. I lived in all over. But I, I, I started out in Hancock Park in an apartment building and my walks throughout Hancock Park took me to a place Marilyn Monroe had lived, to a place Scott Fitzgerald and Zelda had mm -hmm. lived. And I, I saw certain residences. Uh, this was more recent, but Su Wong, the Chinese-American fashion and design icon, has a house called The Sea theaters mm -hmm. in which every movie star and music star of the 60s and 70s and 80s lived. And you can feel it. And I yes. recently filmed her there. And But the first time I lived in a place like that was just Beverly Hills adjacent to the south, a neighborhood referred to as Soro or mm -hmm. Crestview, South Robertson. And I was a housemate of a good friend that you may know, Raina, who is now the godmother of my uh, of my son and Rain Emmanuel Paris, you know, a little prop for her amazing work as a tarot artist and as a depth psychologist and mythologist extraordinaire. But she is the niece of Maria Montez. Maria Montez was the very first Latina star in mm -hmm. Hollywood, and she was also known as the queen of the screams because she. Obviously, she was during sound. She would scream uh, in horror and, and was very famous for that. She was also extraordinarily beautiful. And her younger sister, Raina's mother, was even more beautiful than she. Now, by the time I lived in this apartment that she had graced with her presence, she was gone. But And I'm not a superstitious uh, man, but I swear I... I can give you stories about how she would occasionally inhabit one of the cats of the house and, mm -hmm. and, and play tricks on me or on anyone who was there. So that, again, is it perception? Is it reality? It doesn't really matter. Now, later on, 
when I was living in in a small apartment uh, off of Reeves that I don't know if anyone famous or whatever happened. It's an old apartment building, so I'm sure lots of things uh, and people lived there as well. But I uh, I fell in love and uh, got married and uh, were about to uh, welcome a child. So a friend of my wife's and of mine told us there is a an open house. There's an apartment of the size you would like on Spalding. Take a look. So we came here. And the moment I walked in, uh, my wife turned white. And she said, I know this place. Oh, my God. I know this place. I've been in this place. And she 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 moved around for a little while. I, I fell in love with the light in here and with the, the place itself immediately. Uh, but she was moving around and she opened a pair of doors and inside it's all mirrors. It's a it's a mirrored closet. It's like a like an like a like an indoors bar. But mm -hmm. if, if the doors are closed, it just looks like doors. You open it. It's all mirrors. And she exclaims, oh, my God, this was Nick's place. I got my start in the business in this place. That's incredible. So wow. this turns out this was Nick Cassavetti's last apartment before he hit it big. And he wrote The Notebook, the movie that sprung him out of the gates as a, yes. as, a, as a famous filmmaker in the room, which is now my guest room and my editing room and writing room from time to time when, when people aren't visiting. Oh, my God. What a story. It was great. And she said, oh, I was in this room. And, and, and Nick insisted to give me a role in Me, John Doe. Me, yeah. And uh, what was it? Me, John Doe? No, that was not, not, not Me, Joe Black. The movie with Denzel Washington uh, about a man who takes a hospital hostage because of a heart transplant. Okay, I don't remember the name. Yeah, you know? yeah, I think it was Joe. I think it was John Doe. Uh huh. And uh, or John Q. John Q. For John Q. Public. That's it. That's the name of the movie. Okay. John Q. And it's okay. like it was here. He forced me to take that role. And oh my god. Oh my god. Oh my god. And she she was so troubled. She left. She's like, ah, this is too much. And she left. And the managers had been of the building had been watching and was so impressed. She actually, after my wife left, she approached me and she lowered the wrench said, you, I want you in here. This is meaningful. It seems like it's meaningful. I really want the two of you in here. And so it turns out that everyone in the young Hollywood of Nick's generation had partied in here and had lived in here and breathed in here. But not only that, I found out later this that the apartment right next door to us was home to the most famous parties of the day because it belonged to Dominic Dunn, mm -hmm. D-U-N-N-E. Dominic Dunn, who was a columnist and a writer and an actor, very well known for his participation in the um, O.J. Simpson trials. That's a different story. But when he lived here, every weekend they had barbecues and there are photos with everyone from Marlon, Marlon Brando, Steve McQueen, Natalie Woods, everybody, 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 everybody. And this is now where memory and location start bleeding into each other. And I'm not sure what is reality and what isn't. And that's the reason why we have, it's taken us over a year and a half to organize this, this podcast, because I kept wanting to do more research. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, and unfortunately, I can't confirm these things. But over the years, I've had evidence that uh, from old uh, address books, phone books and such that uh, Lucille Ball lived either in this apartment or in another apartment in this building for a few months while her house on, I think, Rexford was uh, or Lexington was being remodeled her house with uh, with uh, Desi Arnaz, uh, also Betty Davis. And what I was told, but was not able to confirm, was that the reason so many uh, movie stars lived in this place called Beverly Villas it has to do with the fact that the place itself was built by Paramount Pictures Studio mm -hmm. in order to house stars who otherwise wanted to be put up at the uh, Beverly Hills Hotel, mm -hmm. the Beverly Hills Hotel, which was the reason why Beverly Hills exists in the first place. Absolutely. It was a city yes. built around a hotel, right? And so apparently Paramount said, we were just going to create this apartment building. The movie stars will live in the on the first floor, on the second floor, and the maids and the chauffeurs or the parents or the uh, companions, personal assistants will live on the bottom floor, on the first floor. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, I feel those. I was told that uh, Jim Morrison uh, liked the passageway with between Dominic Dunn's apartment and mine. They're connected, and that often he would sneak into what is now my kitchen to pass out on the floor. <laughs> Whether this is true or not, I don't know. But as the Italians say, "Si non è vero, è ben trovato." If it's not true, it's well found. Mm-hmm. Yes, and it must be all very inspiring for you to live um, in an atmosphere like this, being a filmmaker yourself. I think that I would probably create an atmosphere like this using my imagination anyway. And I, yes. I, I think that even growing up in, in Bucharest, Romania, in gray and dusty, scary and censored Bucharest of the 80s, I still believe that uh, I, I, I lived the same way as I do now. Mm-hmm. Now uh, I do surround myself with these objects, and um, see, I have about I have my entire house is filled with paintings from the daughter of Henry Warner, the the founding brother of uh, of, uh, of Warner Brothers, mm-hmm. and uh, Betty Scheinbaum, Betty mm-hmm. Warner, whose daughter uh, Karen Sperling, a uh, glass ceiling breaking director, the first female director in Hollywood who financed her own movies, starred in them and put together an all-female crew, Karen Sperling Warner. Her mom, Betty Scheinbaum, was a died in 97, a celebrated artist. And I was lucky enough to be able to get a number of her paintings. And I could tell you the the history and the meaning behind every, every object uh, wow. in in my house. And I and I'm a little sad because I I think this type of um of historical OCD is something that's getting by and large lost. And I must blame my late father who when we were growing up, when I was growing up in Romania, there were one or two people still living in Romania who had been associated with the royal house with the interbellum period of opulence and tradition and he would send me I was a child of 11 or 12, and he would send me for one hour or two to spend time with these old and very educated people who had no one to talk to. And they would tell me stuff about art history or history in general or an art book, or they would tell me, I think that's a, I think that was from Da Vinci's period. And then I would understand some differences between this and that. And over time, I became rather enamored with the history of uh, objects. Wow. Well, Alex, uh, I really appreciate you taking the time and share your wonderful stories and share your own personal decoding of the imprint uh, that uh, Beverly Hills has and all the um, you know wonderful places that you have mentioned and all the pieces of art uh, that you collect. And your journey is absolutely fascinating. And, uh, you know, from your film acting career to a degree in physics from MIT and then uh, earning an MFA in film production and, and being such a um, renowned filmmaker. So it's incredible that you have all of this within you. And I'm sure that your inner world is the one that, you know, springs out and creates everything that surrounds you. And I hope to see more of your work. And I hope that you will leave your own imprint in this uh, wonderful place where you live right now. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Masha. I hope that uh, I'm sure that I've given you too much, but I hope I've given you enough. And if I may uh, 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 prop up, you know, first of all, like meets like, you went to probably the most difficult film school on the planet. And uh, we're probably one of, I don't know if you were the first woman, but maybe among the first five for sure. And that's incredible that you did that and 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 that you came and made what you're making of yourself. And I've considered you a universalist and a Renaissance person like myself. And if I may, I want to give uh, props for uh, several projects that I have coming out, several Absolutely. documentaries. Absolutely, please do. Yes, I have a, a film uh, called a documentary biography. Uh, I seem to specialize in documentary biographies of uh, powerful women. It might have something to do with the fact that my mother is uh, one such person. But um, there's a movie called um, Elvis, Rocky and Me, the Carol Connors story, which is coming out this late spring, early summer. It's about the life uh, and times of 
iconoclast, maverick, songwriter extraordinaire, Carol Connors, twice Oscar nominated, but that's that's the least of her of her uh, points of interest. She's a formidable uh, character, a little bit like a Zelig or a Forrest Gump of the film industry. If you think that I have touch points with uh, with this his with the history of this place, just wait till you see what what her life is like. And uh, the second one is uh, called AI Spy. I'm working on it right now. It's a love letter to the espionage of the 20th century and the Cold War wow. through the lens of uh, of uh, Valerie Plame, the probably America's most famous spy. And it has to do with how AI, quantum computing, and a global surveillance state are making this obsolete. And I also have a uh, biographical documentary of... Um, Holocaust uh, survivor daughter, Mona Golubek, a great pianist and stage presence. Mm. And I hope to share more with you, Masha. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak of my second favorite subject of all time, me. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. And for, thank you for everything that you shared. And thank you for everything that you do. And thank you for the time that you took to participate today in our conversation. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you very much for tuning in to Feel and Experience Beverly Hills with my special guest, Alex Rotaro. If you enjoy my podcast, In the Mood for California, please sign up for future episodes at your preferred platform and please leave your feedback. I really appreciate your time and support. You can follow me on Instagram at In the Mood for California and check out my website www.inthemoodforcalifornia.com. I'm a realtor with Beverly and Company Luxury Properties, and my license number is 019-78714. Selling and buying homes with soul is not just my real estate strategy. It is an intuitive and holistic approach that embraces your values, aspirations, and conscious intentions. If you want to discover the power of mindfulness in your real estate journey with my compassionate guidance, I'm here for you. I can hardly wait for our upcoming journey to the sprawling expanse of Kenyan country, the largest neighborhood nestled within the vibrant city of Santa Clarita. So looking forward to exploring this vast and picturesque landscape with you. In the mood for California, feel the soul of old Hollywood. <laughs>